Chapter 19 The Clinic Kara What do you mean you won't? I can feel the outrage under my skin as I try to keep a pleasant smile on my face. This is the third emergency clinic we've tried, and all of them are telling me the same thing. Look, sir, we don't treat familiars. I'm sorry for the inconvenience, but this is not a facility that caters to beasts. I grit my teeth to the point that my jaw is aching and force that smile to stay up. It's not an issue with my familiar, it's an issue with a healing spell that I tried out. I've never seen a reaction that intense before, so I wanted to get it checked out. Honestly, sir, if you've already wasted healing spells on your familiar, then it's probably an issue with your training more than anything else. What? The technician quirks a brow and their eyes glaze over with a look of utter disinterest. I have never seen a medic so flippant about an emergency. Your familiar has probably gotten too comfortable with you and is taking advantage of how loose you are in your corrections. If it's still complaining, then you should beat it until it learns its place. You can't just let it complain and walk all over you. My mouth hangs open, trying to come up with a rebuttal for her atrocious statement. But after a few seconds of silence, she rolls her eyes and calls the next person in line forward. I move numbly out of the way and start heading back to the carriage. I didn't think it would be this hard to find someone willing to even look at Blue. It's too late for any place that would treat Blue normally. As it turns out, vets apparently keep very finite hours. Apparently, anyone with an emergency after hours is meant to just wait. The carriage is empty when I get back, and I nearly have a heart attack until I realize that Blue has crammed himself under the seat. Blue... I can't help the sigh that leaves me when I get down on my knees, but I instantly regret it. Blue flinches and curls up tighter in his corner. I wait for a few seconds, hoping it will get him more comfortable with me in his space, but he just starts whimpering. Short, pitiful, gasping little sounds that break my heart. Come on, Blue. Come on out. You're okay. You're okay. I work my hands under his arms and start trying to gently pull him out. He doesn't fight me, just goes with the pull of my arms, but the noises don't stop. I think I'll be hearing those noises in my nightmares. Where to next, sir? The carriage driver pipes up after a long moment of me just holding Blue on the floor. I... I don't know what to tell him. I don't know where to go next. We visited the medical centers open late at night. I guess waiting until the vet opens isn't such a bad idea. I can give Blue more pain medication, then we'll know what to do once he gets checked out. The clinician's words still haunt me, though. I'm worried that the vet's response will be the same. With all that I've read, there's nothing that suggests how to treat familiars with injuries or illness, rather than set them aside and give them time to heal, as though they'll all magically fix themselves. Magic doesn't even work that way. You can... Uh, you can take us back home. I feel more than hear Blue's gasp. It's the only warning I get before he presses into my body, snuggling up to me in a way that surprises me. He's been so distant and scared since we got into the carriage. The shift is worrying, but I decide not to look a gift horse in the mouth. Blue's cold against me, so I focus on letting him sap the warmth from my body. We settle down on the seats before our driver starts our journey home. My hand finds its way into Blue's hair, and I settle down for the drive. Lights from the city pass as we travel back, and my thoughts get swept away in their glow. It's mainly the lantern lights now. Almost all the storefronts have closed, and most residences have blown out the last candles of the night. It doesn't take long to get back to our little district center, the dark streets glowing with the street lamps. I nod along dully as we pass the rows of the local shops. Soraya's General Store, Chiron's Cafe, Nafe's Grocery, the Midnight... The Midnight Clinic! Dear stars, I am stupid. Driver, I'm sorry, can you pull over at the clinic? 
It's a long shot if the medical centers don't take familiars, but I've been to this clinic many times. It's open late at night, and I know a few of the people who work there. They're a local clinic, so they should be able to see Blue. He's a member of the community, after all. I can guilt them into a cursory examination at the very least. It's the best plan I'm able to come up with at the moment. Blue's grown lax under my fingers as he leans against me, but at the mention of our stop he goes a little tense. Master? Come on, just one little stop before we get home, all right? The distance isn't that far, so I scoop him up and resign myself to carrying him into the building. The clinic is still lit, and the place is almost entirely empty. Rows of medical ointment, salves, potions, and bandages lie in the interior of the shop, but my main hope is that there's a physician in tonight. There's a kid up front at the counter, slumped over like he's not used to working the graveyard shift. That is, he's slumped over until he sees Blue and me come in. After that, he's fairly animated. Oh! Hello, sir! Is there anything I can help you with tonight? Yes. Is there a doctor in? There's been a bit of an incident, and I really need to speak with them. Um, Denise got in a few minutes ago. You should be able to see him. Not like anyone else is waiting. The boy motions us into one of the back rooms that functions as a little examination room. He lets us wait in there while he goes to grab the doctor. I set Blue down on the padded examination table in the center of the room. The paper underneath him crackles at any movement, and Blue goes positively rigid, trying to make as little noise as possible. Blue, it's okay. The paper makes that noise. It's not a bad thing. I need you to stay on the table. Can you do that for me? He nods. His ears relax infinitesimally, but I can see his fears aren't assuaged. It feels like I'm talking to a child. Afraid of their first medical examination. It takes a second to register that I probably am dealing with exactly that scenario. Blue, have you ever been to the doctor before? Wide eyes look up at me and I can see that he's just about ready to cry, body vibrating with his efforts to stay still and not disturb the environment around him. Yes, master. He bites his lip. He's obviously concerned about adding the next part of his statement, but I want to know. Go on, Blue. You can ask. Master, have I displeased you? Do you want something about me changed? Blue, what are you talking about? The door flies open and a stocky man in the white and green robes of the medical profession steps in. He has carefully trimmed facial hair and smells faintly of a spice I don't quite recognize. Thin gold wire spectacles sit at the brink of his nose, in perpetual danger of falling off of his face. This is Denise, I presume. He's not a physician I've ever seen before. Sir, how may I help you this fine evening? Denise's charming smile slides off his face and his brow furrows once he sees Blue on the exam table. Why, get down from there, you mangy little thing! Where are your manners? Off that table at once! My heart instantly sinks, but there is still hope. I hadn't exactly told him that Blue would be his patient. Blue shrinks immediately away from the angry tone. His ears go back and his shoulders hunch even closer to his ears than before. He's making himself as small as possible, but isn't leaving the table. Something adjacent to pride bubbles in my chest. Blue's staying on the table, just like I'd asked him. Actually, sir, that's what I need your help with. I assure you I am neither equipped nor trained to deal with disciplinary measures. I have to swallow back the angry retort that threatens to explode out of me. This is, quite literally, the last option. Actually, sir, I need some medical attention for my familiar. He hesitates at that, stroking his chin in a way that suggests that he has better things to do, even though we both know that the clinic is dead at this hour. All right, I'm no vet, but I suppose I can help you with some basic tests. He continues into the room and closes the door behind him. I have to repress the urge to jump in the air and whoop for joy. Finally, some medical help. There are a variety of things that all medical students have to learn regardless of what practice you go into. 
I know many of my colleagues would not be caught dead performing tests on familiars, even though they have the technical wherewithal to do the procedures. You're quite lucky that I think it's such a waste to never put the skills to practice. He rambles as he sets up, pulling on some gloves and pulling out a blank medical file. All right, now, what is this pretty kitty's name? Blue's hands are fisted in the paper, and he almost snaps his neck, turning to look at me. His name is Blue. And today you're coming in for... That gives me pause. I should say that we came in for his wounds specifically, but that's obvious enough. And this would be a great opportunity to get Blue's checkup out of the way. We're in for a checkup, though there are a few concerns that I'd like to bring up at the end. He nods and scribbles on the page. All right, all right. Now, Blue, take off those clothes and we can get started. Blue's hands go to the hem of his shirt before the words process, and I let out a startled, What? What does he need to get undressed for? Well, you do want a complete checkup for your little pet here, right? That quiets me. I don't really know what the checkup will entail. I don't know why I'm questioning a medical professional. My face heats, and I just sit down in the chair near the door. I tell Blue it's okay to continue. Blue strips neatly and efficiently, almost prim in the way he folds the clothes and sets them beside himself. He looks much more relaxed than he was a few moments ago. I suppose anticipation always makes appointments worse. Well, he does have manners. Good boy, the doctor praises him, and Blue's face lifts in a tilted smile that he angles at me. It's almost funny to watch him flaunt his status as a good boy. The doctor goes about taking Blue's temperature, weight, height, and various other measurements, palpating the glands under his arms and at his neck. He examines his eyes, ears, nose, throat, even goes so far as to check his teeth. And all goes well except for an unduly hard tug on Blue's ear when he wasn't staying still enough for the doctor's instrument to get a clear measure. He asks questions most of which I have to refer to Blue's paperwork for, or Blue himself. I've never felt so ashamed to not know so much about a person. The exam goes on fairly normally until we finally reach the subject of Blue's feet. Several different testers come out, and the doctor eventually states that Blue was probably overstressing the newly healed surface. Some caria root cream and plenty of time off of his feet should set him good as new, though it would perhaps be best fixed with some prescribed pain medication which is apparently terribly unorthodox. At my insistence, the doctor writes the note and sends me out to fill it with his assistant while he finishes the last of Blue's testing. You're sure you don't need me for anything else? Oh, just leave the paperwork and we'll be fine. The last part will probably be terribly boring for you. You good, Blue? He simply nods, offering me a small, shaky smile. He's not as nervous as he was coming into the clinic and I can't help but be relieved. All right, I'll be right back. Blue. Master leaves the room and I feel a little piece of me leave with him. I don't want him to leave. I enjoyed having him in the room with me, the way he protested even the slightest of rough treatment. I enjoyed having him in the room when I was being praised, showing him how good I could be when I'm given instructions to follow. I feel awful about how difficult I was being in the carriage. This master has given me nothing but safety and privileges. I should not have let myself jump to conclusions and assume the worst. Doctors, in my mind, are for when master wants to put you down the proper way. Or augmentation. If a master wants to put down a pet without any fuss, then he takes them to the doctor for a shot that will stop their heart, or make them gasp for air that won't enter their lungs. The only other reason for a true doctor is for augmentation that masters can't achieve without the surgical precision of a professional. I've never heard of even the most favored pet being taken to an actual doctor for a checkup. The door closes and the doctor's hand slides through my hair. Yes, quite boring for him. He gets to see you however he likes whenever he wants, doesn't he? And I'm sure you're every bit the good boy you're being for me now. Let's get on with the rest of your exam. The doctor breathes in my ear. I was hoping I wouldn't have to go through with this part of the exam. 
When Master told the doctor that it would just be a checkup, I was relieved, to say the least. Exams aren't too uncommon, especially when you're being graded for sale. Master is new to this, and I haven't had an exam in three or four years. He wants to know if my body is functional, if I'm valuable on the grading system. The doctor continues to pet me for a few more seconds before going back to his file at the desk. I'm quite familiar with these exams, and I want to get back to Master. I want the doctor to tell Master what a good boy I am. The doctor flips through my sale file for a moment, and I just wait patiently. Carrier type, obviously, but I don't see your last heat listed here. When was that? The Masters didn't want to breed from me, so they put a stop to it. Magically? Or physically? With magic, a spell that needs to be done twice a year, I think. Well, aren't you well informed? I bite my lip and don't respond. I'm not technically supposed to know any of this information, but I eavesdropped on my third and fourth masters quite a bit before I was taught better. The doctor fiddles in his desk for a few moments before pulling out a long, slim tube. All right, we'll do your pharyngeal reflex test first. I don't have any of the traditional testers here, this isn't a vet, so we'll have to make do. He makes markings at roughly one inch intervals on the glass component tube before turning back to me. All right, open your mouth. He takes a marked rod and I open up obediently. He slides the rod in smoothly. At least he's not jamming it in at an unpredictable rate. There was one market vet who drove down my price an absurd amount by administering the test that way. I look up at the ceiling to avoid watching the rod and focus on suppressing my gag reflex. I know I've done good by the time I taste the plastic of the doctor's gloves as he slowly pumps the measure in and out for a few seconds. Very good. He says it more to himself than to me, but I still preen at the compliment. Now, hands and knees. I get into position, but his hand slides down and around my neck, pressing me down until my shoulders are resting on the crinkly paper of the table and my ass is raised high in the air. Good. I suppress the urge to roll my eyes, even though I am nearly sure he can't see them. He could have just told me to present. I'm fairly well trained. I know the basic waiting, kneeling, and fucking positions. His fingers are cold and slippery as they reach between my cheeks and push in slowly. Distantly, I'm thankful for both the pace and the lube. I wonder if the pacing I've been awarded is because of my master's apparent favor towards me. It's something else I'll have to thank him for when this is done. Ah, you are quite snug, little one. I'm sure your master appreciates it. It has been a few days since anyone's had me. Master took me away from the market before the night guards came on shift, and no one so much as played with me down there since. I'm as surprised as him at my tightness. I quietly suppress the twinge of pain that comes with the intrusion. The doctor's finger searches for only a few minutes before settling on the little nub of nerve endings inside me. I know it's the point of this exam, but I still startle as he focuses on my prostate. Few masters pay any attention to it. They usually only bother with it on accident, or they spend all their time fixating on it, playing with me until I really am only an animal desperate to end the stimulation. Almost immediately I'm hard, and I can feel myself growing slick. The doctor's fingers play more within me, and I focus on the examination I'm getting. Responsiveness is a very important indicator for being sold. If you can come untouched within reasonable amount of time, it will increase your grade. I focus on the stimulation and the task at hand. Master took me when I was a dirty little thing clinging to the bars of my cage. I want to prove to him that I'm good, that I'm worthy of him. I don't know many things, but what I've been trained to do, I, I can do well. I want to be able to serve him, make him happy, even if this is the only thing that I can do. You're drawing me in, little one, pulling me forward into you. I bet you are quite the pleaser when it comes to your master. This is why you're so favored, is it not? 
This is why he'd come all the way out here in the middle of the night to make sure you're okay. Master has done a lot for me, even in the short time that he's known me. Even with the pitiful little that I've done for him. I think of all the beautiful privileges that Master has allowed me in the day and a half I've known him. All the wonders that he's shown me, the warmth and the kindness. But it's the memory of his face, the night he let me sleep next to him, that tips me over the edge. I come right there on the table under the doctor's fingers. That's a good boy. Oh, you must be a favorite. I feel dirty inside. I'm breathing deeply trying to force air into my lungs after this intense exam, but that doesn't disguise the sound of ruffling clothes that comes behind me. Ice lodges itself in my chest as the doctor speaks. Your master wouldn't mind if I take a little taste, would he?